like the last fish we need for the morning for our shore lunch and this is the perfect size you want to keep anything around that 16 inches that's just the perfect size walleye to eat for shore lunch so we're going to keep this one and uh we're gonna do the traditional shore lunch we're going to show you everything to do with shore lunch today how to uh pick a location how to set it up what you need and everything so Stay with us here and we're gonna get to this shore lunch spot and uh, get to cooking up these walleyes. All right, so we made it to our shore lunch spot and let's talk a few considerations that uh, go into picking a good shore lunch location. So with this location here, you can see all around me here that it's nice and open. And why you want that is for the bugs. If you're in a really buggy area, if you got a nice clearing like this, some wind moving through it, you're not gonna get eaten alive and the guests are really gonna enjoy their shore lunch a lot more when they're not getting destroyed by bugs. But uh, so a nice open location like this, but it does have some cover. So when the sun gets past us here or behind these trees, you do have some shade and it's uh, you know, a really nice area. So we look for that when picking a location, you know, good open area, uh, good solid ground. And uh, another good thing to look for is accessibility by the boats. So you need a location that you can pull up really easy with your boats and you're not gonna damage the boats. So if you got multiple boats, different people driving, you know, you don't want a ton of hazards in there. Someone's gonna nick a prop or bump a lower unit or something. You want a nice clean approach to the spot and good and easy access up and out of the boats. So that is another key consideration to, to take in factor on picking a shoreline location is the accessibility from the getting the boats to the shore and getting out of the boats onto the shore. That's two big factors. And uh, another thing we look for is um, just the general location, like the, uh, the scenery around it. You look around here and I mean, we've got a great view of the lake. There's, uh, there's nothing out here. I mean, it's just the Canadian wilderness. It's just beautiful scenery up here. Um, not much to be seen in the fact of uh, cottages or anything here, but if you were at a location like that, you know, it'd be nice to get away from boats and traffic and that, but uh, we don't really have that issue here, but it's just uh, a nice location. That's, a, that's one of the other key factors. So another thing you can look for is uh, what's around the area. And this area actually provides the guests with something else to do during the shore lunch or whoever you have with you. And uh, you can see this little guy here, he's already picking some berries, but uh, you know, this shore lunch spot actually offers us uh, a bunch of wild, wild edibles. You know, you've got raspberries here and we've got blueberries and they're all nice and ripe this time of year. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. We've got, uh, the availability for the guests or whoever to go around and pick up some uh, some little snacks while you're cooking the shore lunch. So another characteristic that a good shore lunch spot has is availability of firewood. If shore lunch spots have been hit over and over again, generally they're going to be lacking good firewood, but uh, a good location is going to have a lot of deadfall and uh, you're, you don't want to strip any new trees or the bark or rip any green branches off. That stuff's not going to burn properly for you. You want this nice deadfall, uh, this nice dry kindling and the sticks, and that stuff's gonna get that uh, that oil nice and hot to cook your fish properly. And, and when you have a ton of that around, it just makes life easier for everybody. The guests usually, once you're starting to prep your fish and that, the guests will usually start gathering up the firewood. And uh, I mean, you can look around this spot here and there's just firewood everywhere. So you're able to grab it really quick. And that's the stuff you want because it burns nice and hot really quick. So one of the key things about using all the deadfall and that is you're not uh, stripping fresh trees of their wood. You know, you're not killing them. You're not causing any damage that uh, you, you shouldn't be causing. Really, the only thing we're leaving here is our footprints once we're done. And uh, and that's what we're trying to do. So it's nice to have lots of deadfall like this. You can see this one, people have stripped the bottom branches off it already and, and use them as firewood. But uh, there's so much around here, so. All right, so let's talk about this fire pit. You can see here, somebody had an old round fire pit before and that just doesn't work so the fire pit that we use anyways is this design here so what this helps with is actually feeding the fire so when you have these big round fire pits they look nice and everything but uh when you have to go and restock the fire and you run out of wood you need to take your pans off and your grills and when you have two pans running and uh two grill tops or anything else it just it's a mess like you've got to move all your food you've got to take the grills off and they're all hot so you've got to be wearing gloves or have some other means of taking it off but uh so the fire pit that we do is this design here and uh what we do is just basically two rocks with flat tops on each side of it and we just take a grill top and uh it can be a grill from anything you can find one from an old barbecue anything really and as long as it fits across level and it doesn't shift around when your pan's on there you don't want your pan wobbling but so a pit like this, what it lets you do is just feed the firewood in and out. So you can just slide it in from the side and you don't have to move your pan or whatever you're cooking with here. So this is the best way of doing this because it's just 
you don't have to move anything. You can just feed the fire as it goes and it's, it's pretty simple, it's straightforward. All right, one thing about the fire pits too, when you are picking your rocks, don't pick rocks from the shoreline or any rocks that are near the water. So those rocks are gonna hold water and as soon as you heat them up, they're gonna explode and pop and they're gonna send little bits of rock all over the place. And as it goes, it usually ends up in your food. So nobody likes crunchy bits of rock in their food. So definitely don't pick rocks from the shoreline that are wet or anywhere near the water because they will explode on you and uh, it can actually be pretty dangerous so but the worst part is if you get it in your food you don't want that all right so another big thing is if you're in bear country like we are here if you can pick a small island that is your best location if you don't have the option of picking a small island you know one thing you have to do and what we used to do is you rotate the areas that you use for a shore lunch so we do over 90 to 100 shore lunches a year in a season and uh, you know, if you go back to the same spot every day, in and out, you're going to have a bear there every time. So what we do is we rotate the spots if they're on mainland or a bigger island. So what happens is you go to one one day and then you don't come back to it for about four or five days. And that gives the chance for the bears to come in there. If there's anything left, clean it all out, say leftover food or whatever that uh, was dropped off a plate or whatever. And uh, you know, they can sniff around the fire pit, find out that there's nothing there and they're not gonna be there if you show up the next day and uh, try to do a lunch and he comes barreling out of the woods at you and your guests. Okay, so the first cut we make is right by the vent here. You're gonna stay on the top side of the spine. You make a cut right through like that. And then you're gonna go right back to the base of the tail and you're not gonna cut through, you're gonna leave that little end there. So now you come up here between the pectoral fin here and you cut straight down to the spine. So now you flip the fish straight up and down and you see here, you've got the end of the one cut here and the top of the other. So now you're just gonna join these two cuts. You're gonna cut right along tight to the spine and get those cuts lined up. So now you start cutting the fish from the top down. So you just kind of spread it open with your fingers like that. And now you're just following the rib cage. So you follow the rib cage all the way down. So we're cutting out the main, the main bones right now. We're just gonna follow them all the way right through. Right to the bottom. And to make it easier, I'll just cut it straight through the bottom like that. Now I'm gonna flip this over. So now we've got that nice walleye fillet there. There's no rib bones in it, but there's still pin bones. You can see this little line of bones right here. So I'm gonna take the skin off first. So what I do, that's why we leave that tag in there. So that keeps that makes it easier to take the skin off. So I'm gonna put my knife here, I'm gonna push it all the way down to the skin, put a bend in it, and just push and pull. So now I've got the skin still attached to the fish there. So now we've got these pin bones here. You can see right here there's a line of bones. So I take my knife and I'm just gonna notch them out. So I'm just gonna cut a little notch like that on both sides of it, just kind of V-notch it out of there and then I can just pull them right out. So all those bones are in this little strip right here. So there you go, there's your nice walleye filet, completely boneless and skinless. There's no bones at all in that. Uh, and that'll save the most of the fish possible for you. Okay, so the other reason of leaving those tag ends on is your fish is all one piece. So now you can dispose of it as one solid piece. You don't have a bunch of different pieces. So we like to throw our fish in the water here just because there's a lot of turtles and the turtles will eat that. And, uh, you know, we're not promoting bears to come into the area when we throw it in the water. So that's what we do with our fish scraps. But uh, depending where you are, certain regulations are different and you're actually not allowed to throw it back in the water in some places that uh, we go to. So check your regulations and see what to do. But for me, I'm going to throw this in the water today. <laughs> Oops. See, I said the turtles. We'll eat them right away. The yellow turtle. The yellow turtle. I'm just going to rinse these fillets off quick in the lake. Just clean any, uh, anything left on them, any debris. Nice clean water in this lake here.
right, so let's cover what I bring with me in a shore lunch kit. So first thing you need is a pan. So this is a uh, carbon steel pan. You can use cast iron pan as well. These carbon steel ones work really well. Uh, nice and wide, you wanna be able to get a bunch of fish in there and a bunch of fries. So then up from there, I bring a uh, actual, the base of a cardboard box. So that actually works as a nice liner for your fries and your fish too, just kind of a serving tray, disposable. You can burn it right after. We bring a, uh, a strainer so you can get in the oil there for your fries. Uh, a couple sets of uh, cutlery and plates for your guests and yourself. We bring some baskets, some fancy little uh, kind of takeout baskets. You know, you can throw your fries in there and your fish. We also uh, pack our oil in these uh, little water jugs basically. So they're sealed tight and that you can bring two liters of oil with you or however many you want. But uh, that's a good way of packaging your oil so it doesn't leak everywhere, it doesn't cause a mess on you. From there, you also need a set of tongs. So a nice set of metal tongs to reach in the oil to flip your fish and uh, do any work in the oil that you need to do. We bring roll of paper towels to clean out your pan and uh, for the guests, your fillet knife, that's one, uh, one thing you always have. Then we bring all our uh, condiments and all the uh, spices and sauces. A, uh, a good can opener, you gotta have a good can opener with you. Bring a, uh, the fish batter here. We've got uh, our beer batter, which we're gonna do today. This all right, so you need a lighter and uh, some matches. We usually bring both, because if uh, lighter gets wet, it doesn't work. So always have waterproof matches with you as well. Um, can of corn and a can of beans. You gotta have that on a shore lunch. Pretty, uh, pretty standard anywhere you go. And uh, you know, your fillet knife and uh, a knife sharpener. From there, one thing, normally we just bring the fries up, but I wanted to show you, this is one of the best tips I can give you for making your fries, is to soak them in water overnight, or as long as you can. That pulls all the starch out of the fries, and they actually crisp up a lot better when you do that. So. I just brought this out. Usually I'll just bring the fries out after they've soaked in the water, but I wanted to show you that this actually makes your fries a lot better. So soak your uh, fries in water overnight. We just use a fry slicer back at the camp, slice them up pretty fast and uh, it works really well. So try that out and it will actually improve the quality of your fries by a lot. So we use a potato slicer that we picked up uh, pretty cheap at Canadian Tire actually, it was like 10 bucks, but uh, so it makes them all consistent size and it saves you a lot of time. You don't have to uh, spend your, your shore lunch there slicing up potatoes. So we bring them out beforehand. They're all the same size, they cook consistently and they cook the same time. So it saves you so much time when you're out there guiding. Just uh, you can pick little things up like that that helps you as a guide. And uh, it doesn't cost you a lot really, but it saves you so much time and uh, a lot of headache really. So, so one thing to do is to uh, spice it up a little, literally. and. Uh, we bring all kinds of different spices and seasonings and you know you can base it off of where your guests come from if they're from the south you know deep south you know you've got the creole or the spicy cajun seasonings if they're uh you know a little further north they don't like it as spicy and as hot food so you can bring different things like this is a uh, french fry seasoning parmesan and garlic so that one's not spicy at all but this one's a, a heavy heavy cajun that uh you know is from louisiana so those boys love that but uh as a guide, you know, it benefits you to bring your own spices and seasonings and to change things up a little, you know. If you can find a bunch of uh, packaged batters as well, it saves you a lot of time, you know, and uh, and you can do little things like this is, a, this is a beer batter we're doing today and it just improves the quality of the fish fry so much, like just a nice, you know, pub style fish and chips instead of just a flour coating that you would get at most lodges or anything. And uh, you know, another thing we do that I like to do is I bring an onion and I'll slice it up and we're gonna do beer battered onion rings as well. And that is probably one of the biggest hits that I have out of all the guests. They just love these onion rings. And uh, as a guy, just doing little things like that just improves your shore lunch and uh, the guest experience with you. So today I'm gonna show you my favorite recipe that uh, that everybody rants and raves about, but uh, beer battered onion rings. So once they have them, they always want them, they always request them, and it's not very much effort to do. You just need an onion and your leftover batter from the fish. So it's pretty simple, but uh, man, they're delicious. It's All right, so we're just slicing up our onion here for the famous beer battered onion rings. And all I do is just cut the ends off them. You can discard the ends, they're pretty useless. That'll be the only thing that's ever left at a shore lunch spot too. Nothing eats the onions. I don't know why we eat them, but nothing else wants to eat them, anything in the wild. But uh, 
So we take the onions and I just pop out the centers of them and then you have these nice uh, individual onion rings. Look at those. This is better than you get at the fast food restaurant, I'm telling you. Higher quality, better tasting. And on a shore lunch, you just can't beat it. Check that out. That's more than uh, we'll be able to eat for a week here. <laughs> way we eat. All right, so I poured my batter mix in here and I'm pouring in a bit of beer and it really helps to use a dark beer. This is uh, it's Rickard's Red here and it just gets that fish just extra flavorful with the darker beer that you use. So much better. So what I'm looking for here, you can see I'm just gonna mix it in and uh, I'm looking for like pancake batter consistency. So once I get that, and it's, uh, you don't want it super runny and you don't want it super thick, but uh, if it's super runny, it'll just run right off the fish in the pan when you have it in the oil. And that's, uh, you just get some nice uh, oil flavored fish scent. It's not that good. So you want to get that nice uh, pancake batter consistency and that way it'll stick to the fish and uh, your onion rings perfectly and you will have perfect restaurant style fish. So the beer is in a water bottle because it is a leftover beer from uh, a shore lunch yesterday. Last night. Last night, shore dinner. <laughs> we do a lot of shore lunches here. And uh, yeah, when no sense in wasting it, just use it again. It was from last night, it's still good. The batter's getting to be the right consistency, you can see there. It's not super runny, but it's not super thick either. So it's just, just perfect. That's what you want to get the perfect fish out of that. So one thing I forgot to mention is it's uh, really good to have a good set of heavy duty gloves on you when you're cooking this shoreline. So the first thing I'm doing here, I got the fire going and I'm just heating up the pan and I'm just gonna clean it out. So all the oil in there from before, you never wanna run water in them or anything. So I'm just heating up the oil that's in there and the leftover and uh, I'm just gonna wipe it out quick. So you need a set of heavy duty gloves for that and uh, it'll clean it right out and it stays nice and seasoned for you. There we go. That pan is nice and clean and ready for oil. All right, so I'm just gonna get the oil in the pan here and uh, really it depends on what you're cooking. If you're putting fries in there, you need to get a little bit more oil in there just to coat all the fries. If you're doing fish, you don't need as, just straight fish, you don't need as much oil as you would as if you're doing fries and fish, so. We're just gonna put in a little bit more, and what I want is just enough to just get those fries fully coated in the oil. So I'm getting enough oil in there just so the fries will float when they're done. They're not, uh, you don't want them just sitting on the base of the pan because then they can't flip around either. The bottoms will just get burnt on them. So you just need enough oil in there to get them so that they're floating in the pan. So that's about the right amount right there. If your pan's not level, just use a little stone to uh, shim it up straight again. Cool. So how do you know when the oil's ready? I just throw one fry in there right away. And once it starts bubbling like that, you know it's good to start getting your uh, fries right in there. But uh, that'll let you know how hot the oil is without using a thermometer or anything. So you just want that slow bubble like that. If you get uh, your fish in there when it's too hot, it'll just burn the sides of your fish really fast, burn the outside and the inside won't be cooked. So right there is that perfect amount of uh, boil that we want on that oil. So we cook the fries first and the reason we do that is uh, they're the side dish to the fish and uh, they can sit out while the fish doesn't take very long to cook. You know, you get the fries done and the fish will be done in a matter of minutes after that. So the fish, the fries take the longest. So we cook them first and uh, you know, it gets them on the, on the fire. And once they're ready, you know, they can sit out a little longer. Nobody likes eating cold fish, but uh, the fries will stay warm. You know, you keep them covered in tin foil in your uh, little placeholder there and uh, they stay good. So we always cook the fries first. And then the next thing we get going is our, uh, our beans and corn. So we actually cook them right in the cans and uh, the only thing you got to do with them is just make sure that you crack the cans open a little bit. So I've seen guys before just throw them right on the uh, 
on the fire unopened and that ends up being an exploded mess so make sure you crack the lids on them <laughs> let any uh some some air escape from in there so i'm gonna get the beans and corn on there and make sure the lids are cracked the fries are getting pretty close to done here so i'm just gonna actually set these right on this rock right beside the the fire pit that's gonna get them hot enough but check out these fries so we try not to uh to mess them around too much just let the fries do their thing you stir them around once you get them in there at the beginning they they're a little mushy once they get in the oil right away so when you start mashing them around in there they get uh, broken up and all kind of messed up so try to leave them on their own and let them cook but uh you know they will crisp up really nice and you can see right now they're just getting to be that nice golden brown color but i'm gonna let them just uh crisp up a little more they're still just a little soft so a little bit longer and they're done so these fries are nice and done now they're starting to crisp up nice and golden brown on the outside just gonna take my strainer and strain them right out and uh we're gonna use our nice handy uh cardboard box lined with some paper towels so gonna strain them out a bit lay them out on the uh the little platter there so we use the cardboard tray with the paper towel just to absorb all the oil, the extra oil, and it keeps the fries stay crispier as they uh, they dry off there. If you just used a, uh, a plastic plate or a uh, aluminum foil tray, they would just turn to mush right away. So this just helps them stay crispy and uh, drains them off of any extra oil. So these fries are fresh out and we're just gonna season them up nice and quick. We're gonna put some Cajun on there. Get a little kick to them, a little sweet flavor. And then uh, we will also put some of Emily's favorite here, some uh, Parmesan and garlic. I think if you just threw the whole thing of garlic on there, she would like it. <laughs> We're gonna go a little easy on that. So it's important to spread them out on the tray. If you have them all heaped up in a big mound, they just get all soggy and uh, yeah, they're not that good to eat. So keep them nice and spread out, the grease, absorbs into the paper towel and the cardboard and they stay nice and crispy for you. So back to the batter and the fish, the best part. The next thing we do is the fish. We always do the fries first, then we do the fish, then I do the onion rings last actually. So we like to cut them up into nice small little pieces like that. It's just the size we like to eat. Um, I left one in a full fillet so you can see how how it works there. But uh, So just get a nice consistent coating on all of your, your fish here. And uh, I like to get a couple prepared at once there, just so you're not just throwing them in at different times. You can throw them all in at the same time, kind of. So just get a nice consistent coating here. It's a little messy on the fingers, but you've got a lake right there to clean yourself up with, so it's not that big of a deal. So we'll get a few pieces started right away here. I'll put the small one in just to test the, uh, the heat of the pan here, so we'll see. See how that goes. Okay, so that's a little hot right now. That one's gonna cook too fast. That's gonna be a sacrifice. You can see how that's browning up too fast right away. So that oil is too hot for this fish. So that's the thing about cooking over an open fire is you have to uh, deal with the temperature. So that's gonna be a sacrifice piece. If your pan gets too hot like that, the best thing to do is take it right off the fire and cook with it on the ground. It's still gonna retain the heat and uh, you're gonna be able to cook the fish at the right temperature if you take the pan, the pan right off the grill like that. So you can see how that piece just browned up way too fast, turned too dark, so the outside's cooked but the inside's nice and raw. <laughs> so that is a sacrifice piece, but we're gonna keep it in the oil just to see what the temperature of the oil's at. Okay, so the other way of cooling your oil down a bit too is putting a bunch of pieces in at the same time. So now that we've got that pan off the grill, I'm gonna start throwing a few pieces in here nice and quick. One of the key things with the beer batter is to get it flip right away. And that way it seals the batter around both sides of the fish. If you, uh, if you don't flip it right away and you just leave it sit in the oil, 
the batter can run off the top side of the fish and then you only have batter on the one side. So you can see the difference here in, uh, in the color of the fish. So the ones on the right are from the really hot oil. The ones on the left are from the, the medium temperature oil. So some people enjoy their fish more darker like this and really crispy. Emily would be one of those. And other people enjoy it more this this color here. So this is the other full fillet. I'm gonna get that flipped. And this is starting to run out of heat now. So I'm gonna put this back on the on the grill here. So these pieces here on the right are pretty well done. You can hear how crispy they are. They're just done so well with this beer batter. It's just it's unbelievable batter. It just tastes so good the fish perfectly. Fish and chip style. So I'm gonna get these ones out. Let them drain a little bit. They'll still cook once you take them out of the out of the oil and put them on the on the rack there. They still still cook on the inside a little bit. All right, so one question people always ask is how do I know when the fish is done, when the outside's brown, or how do I know the middle's done? So I'm gonna cut into a piece here just to show you, and uh, we'll cut it open like that. And you can see on the inside here how it's just nice, white, and flaky. If it's any like sort of rubbery texture or wet inside the middle still, it's not done. So once you get that nice, white, flaky texture in the middle, it's done perfect. The outside is all up to you after that. If you want to crisp it up really, really dark or if you want to keep it a little lighter colored on the outside. Right, so the rest of these are done. So you can see these are just a little lighter colored from just a less hot oil. And this is the full filet. This is not my favorite way of doing it, but uh, some guys like doing the full filets. But it's just a big chunk of fish thing. So check that out. There is our nice Main course anyways for the shore lunch here. I'm gonna get the onion rings going here and that's gonna be the final thing for this shore lunch. So I take the rest of my beer batter for these onion rings and I just coat the full onion ring in batter inside and out. And from there, you're just gonna to toss her in the oil. You got one going here already. I'm gonna flip it right away. And that is how you make these delicious onion rings. onion rings and we're set all right so we're all done here now um, we've got our beer battered fish we've got our Cajun seasoned fries beer battered onion rings some corn and some beans and uh, we're all set to eat now so we usually dish up here for the guests and uh, they just kind of file by and we serve them their food but uh, I'm gonna get this one ready for Emily here so let's get her some fries here some corn and beans and she likes the crispy fish, so we'll get her those nice crisp pieces here and a couple onion rings. Look at that. I swear that some guests come up here just to eat the shore lunch. I don't even think they like fishing, they just like eating the shore lunches. So that's what you get. There's a uh, traditional beer battered shore lunch. So that is what Thank we were talking you. about today. All right. Listen to the crunch on that. The famous beer battered onion rings. So good. And a nice beer battered walleye. That is good. That's what you come to a short lunch for right there. Nice fish and chip style fish. Beans, corn, beer battered onion rings, and fries. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that right there. All right, so we caught our walleyes. We were using those VMC Moon Eye jigs. It took us a whole two minutes to get our two walleyes for shore lunch. Then we came over here, picked our location, and uh, all those factors considered, 
Then uh, we showed you how to do this uh, shore lunch from everything from start to finish. Um, beer battered walleyes, beer battered onion rings, Cajun seasoned fries, beans and corn, all done over the fire. And uh, this is how we would do the shore lunch for a guest at the lodge. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, start to finish, how we did this shore lunch. And uh, maybe you can take this to your home waters and uh, you know catch a few walleyes and go out with family and friends and enjoy shore lunch. And uh, if you do, let us know in the comments and uh, how it was and uh, if you like the beer battered onion rings and the beer battered walleyes let us know it's uh it's awesome i'm telling you you need to try it if you if you haven't but uh thanks for watching this video and uh we definitely have some more cooking ones on the way some more shore lunch videos so thanks for watching this one and uh like and subscribe and we'll see you on the next video so one thing we always do is make sure we put the fire out thoroughly and that requires lots of buckets of water Yeah.